because so we don't we normally just have one or two of us have a lachaim mm-hmm. at the beginning of the year. But today was the birthday in Yerushalayim of my oldest son and the birthday of my newest grandson who oh, just arrived. So in case you want to drink a lachaim, I brought some extra glasses. But if you, if it's not your your uh, cup of tea. minhag cup of tea, <laughs> cup of single malt, yes. don't feel just have a, a lachaim on me. And the cost goes far. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 for the baby, not for the baby. But, yeah, for the baby, a little baby pop. I have to try it on. I I would, I really do Don't have to try it on. Yeah, you really do have to try it on. Okay, <laughs> so therefore, oh, it's there. No, okay. Just missed miss the Lachaim to my new grandson who was born today. Uh, would you like some Lachaim? Coke. Uh, okay. Much more powerful drug. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay, good. So, this year, uh, I have to say, it's because it's after Shavuot, I, I think this is Tuesday. I'm completely, uh, are you feeling that? Yeah. Totally disoriented. So, I remember one, I, when I'm in Manchester, I usually give a shear in the biggest um, uh, shul, the Haredi shul there called Masakia Das. And I walked in there once and I said, um, I can, I've come without my notes, which I don't normally do. I come without my notes. Afterwards, they said that's a much better shear than when you have your notes. Which is <laughs> anyway, so I think this is going to be a little bit of a getter of that as well. Anyway, the cute sir, I don't know if you saw the title of the shear. Um, the title of the shear was regarding Avram Avinu, uh, uh, and the the idea was what, did, what was the lotion we used for the shear? The enigma. The enigma of, of Avram Avinu's ultimate test, chesed. chesed, ultimate chesed, and how to and how to copy it. Now, obviously, um, at a very simple level, um, it goes to that saying that Avram Avinu um, and all the Gedalim, everything we learn about them is, I mean, we consider it. I mean, what do, what do we know about Avram Avinu and the Chumash? What do we learn about him? Come out nothing. I mean, it's only a sketch of his life. Yitzchak has come out the invisible man of the office. Almost nothing at all about him. And Yaakov, a little bit more. So we're only getting a little feel, but certainly we know that Avram Avinu had 10 tests. And Rabbi Desla points out that all the tests of Avram Avinu were tests which tested him not in his natural meter. So the natural meter of Avram Avinu obviously was Chesed. Um, but none of the tests that Avram Avinu was given, therefore, were tests of Chesed, because he's already mashlim that. So Chazal say that if a person bases his avoida, his relationship with Hashem, solely on, on Chesed, then that is innately dangerous. There's a whole arichas in why that would be. There would be too much Chesed in the world. And too much chess in the world is an extraordinarily dangerous thing. Why is it an extraordinarily dangerous thing? So, if you th- if you think in the Seder of Kedoshim, oh, I forgot where it is, I think it's chapter Kof and Yud Zayin. The sister, marrying the sister. Yeah, the marrying That's the sister. Chesed who? Right? Chesed who, yeah. So it says, a man who marries his half-sister, chesed who? So why on earth, and how on earth could you define chesed, uh, incest as being chesed? So we talked about this before once, if you remember. Because the, uh, the, if your nature is to be a Baal or Baalas Chesed, then automatically you find it extremely difficult to say one word, not word, as we, when we discussed this a few weeks ago, is no. Because a Baal Chesed, by definition, can you lend me some money? Can you give me some money? Can you do this? Can you do the other thing? Can you help me? Then the Baal Chesed finds it extraordinarily difficult to say no. So Abram Avinu, who's made of his Chesed, as soon as he arrives in Eretz Yisrael, then there's a famine, and he has to leave straight away, and he has to go into Golish. Rabbi Desta's model for Gola says there's something innately wrong with Klal Yisrael. And the Mida that we are in trouble with is the basic Mida, the main Mida of the nation into which we are exiled. So if you think about Churban Ba'as Rishon, at that time our Averas were Gilir Ra'as, Shif Chastamim and Avod Azara. But Chazal say the, the Shif Chastamim, the murdering and the, and the Avod Azara was only to allow us to have the sexual immorality. So you want somebody else's wife, kill him and take her. Oh, you feel a little bit guilty about this? Well, let's just change Judaism, reform it here, reform it there, or just get rid of it altogether and bring in something new. It says that's perfectly acceptable behavior. So therefore, the, uh, the Talal Shab was thrown into Gauls, the Gauls of Bovel and Bovel today, when we discussed this, I pointed out, I don't know if you, if you went and looked it up, but in English, Bovel, Babel, a Babylon, is a, a euphemism for a sexually corrupt society. And the idea is that we're thrown into that. It's a semen, because Mida Kanek and Mida is a chesed in its own right, because it lets you know what you've done wrong. 
and therefore you're thrown into it, you know what you've done wrong, and hopefully you can stop doing it. And more than that, Doesn't again, it worse? sorry? Doesn't it make it worse? What do you mean? You have a weakness, you're throwing them into a oh, situation. Oh. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? It's a bit like saying a guy's got a weakness for alcohol, and then you'll, you'll throw Something him into wrong. a distillery, uh, and that will cure him. Mm, don't think so, that will kill him. Do think so. Uh, that seemed far more likely. So Ramadessa says something which is very, very interesting. Uh, and it was one of the most exciting ideas that I ever came across when I first started learning Rabbi Desta. And that he says that the human psyche is, devel- is divided in two parts, it and ego, gaiva and taiva. So he says a very interesting thing, all taiva, anything we have physical desire for, has a natural saturation point and a give up point, including incidentally alcohol. When you take too much, you will throw up, you'll eventually knock yourself out and you will vomit. Um, and your body will say that's enough, it just can't take any more. Mm-hmm. Sorry for that day, that's right. Um, but, and then there's a problem, then it becomes addiction, then addiction, so that becomes a very different shy there, really. But anything which is you a tie before mm-hmm. has a limitation, sorry? They'll have withdrawal. Yeah, and that's if they want to deal with it, yes. But certainly then it becomes, now it becomes a physical addiction, it's not a psychological addiction. Um, funnily enough, cocaine, saying some of do we make the joke about cocaine? Or I made a joke about cocaine before. Which you didn't hear. Anyway, cocaine, interestingly. Cocaine? Oh, you know this. Um, okay, so cocaine. It's not a physically addictive drug, isn't that interesting? Really? No. Psychologically addictive drug. But not, yeah, no. trust me, I know a lot about drugs. I used to be working campuses for 25 mm-hmm. years. I mean, in so many training courses and drugs, you wouldn't believe it. Hey, man. Um, anyway, so. So basically, <laughs> so I don't have to okay, I'm getting thrown off completely. Oh, so, but if it is time for, well, it's, it's time for business, et cetera, et cetera, then it's got a cut off point and it becomes, oh, I don't, maybe it's a, a shocking, maybe unnecessary to say this, but when, when, I, when I left the United Kingdom, again, I think at, at working at universities, you get all the latest information. The number one reason for, no, every, I think it's 60% of all marriages end in divorce in the UK. The number one reason that they end in divorce is money. No, no, nowhere near it. Yeah, alcohol. No, not alcohol. No. <laughs> Scotland, maybe alcohol. Yeah, uh, not drugs. No, it's a bit of an out of base, really. Well, why would why would most marriages end in divorce? Adultery, adultery. What percentage ends in divorce because of adultery? Eighty-five percent. 85%. Now, I was involved in several adultery cases when I was in living in England. As, as a rabbi, I quickly uh, hasten to add. Um, and in and, and each case, uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the couples, who were sadly, I'm talking about from couples, uh, did not want their children to know why the marriage had fallen to bits, and therefore they just put on the divorce papers mutual incompatibility. So what the real figure is for adultery, because that's the, that's the stated figure, is 85% of all divorces. Now, the, the majority of people get divorced. So that means that never, most people are doing that. And the reason that they are committing adultery is because they're bored with that side of life. And the Torah knows that, which is why we have a whole device, a whole mechanism called Taras Mishpacha, which stops that which is a taiva from becoming boring. So as we know, there's, there's the mikvah and the period of separation, etc., which allows you to become more interested in any type of... Uh, the, the usual boring marshal I give is, suppose your favourite meal is pizza and french fries, in which case, incidentally, you have a se- severe dietary problem. But if that's your your your, uh, your favourite meal, you come home Monday night and your wife has made you um, pizza and french fries, or for those watching who are politically correct, you made yourself pizza and french fries, because uh, that's, that's all that was left in the freezer. Uh, you then uh, come home the next night and your wife makes you another pizza and french fries. And you go, ah, ah, ah. But if she makes it three nights in a row, then automatically become sickened by it. That's if it's taiva. But if it's gaiva, as Rabbi Destiny's great Talmud, Rabbi Mordechai Miller, of Gateshead used to say, if it's gaiva, gaiva is like a row of zeros after your bank account with you know a figure in front of it. The more zeros you see, the more you like. So the thing is that if it's taiva, which in the case of Korban Bashrishan was Zenus, adultery and all that sort of thing, it's got a natural cut-off point, right? And then they get sick of it, you do too much of it, you get sick of it, and fine, and then you can walk away from it. 
Um, but if in the second base of Mikdash, then it's something which comes from, it's a, it's a Yitzhar of Gaiva, and it's got no end. So when Yaakov Avina sees, you know, the, the Malachim of all the various Golas going up and down the angel, all in the Yardim Bo, the Malachim were the, they were called the Sarim, the Malachim who got, or the guardian angels, like a, a heavenly united nations. So he saw the uh, he saw the Babylonian angel going up seventy rungs in the ladder. I can't remember the figures actually. One hundred twenty, I think, was was uh, Greece, etc. And then comes down. But when he sees the Tsar of Esau going up, because that one doesn't come down, and the the, the Medrash, if you see this in the Ramban there, uh, he quotes the the, the Posuk in, in Michal, which says, "Afilo like even if he flies like an angel, Uben Hakachovim Som Kinech." And between the stars, he makes his home. I feel him show the ruach in the mission. Even from there, I will knock, him, I will pull him down. So Hashem says, which sounds is very sounds rather strange. Even what's that talking about? Even if he makes his home amongst the stars, weird. What's interesting is only in our time that um, that humanity has made their home amongst the stars. Look up in the dark night, and you might see a little light traveling much quicker than the stars round and round. This is the space station. And when a man first fit, set foot on on uh, another planet, which was the moon, um, uh, a long time ago now, actually, um, you remember he jumped down and he said, this is a giant step, a great a small step for me, a giant step for my kind of thing. What was the name of the spacecraft that landed on the moon? No, that was the rocket. Enterprise. That's a TV series. The, the ship no, it's called Eagle. Eagle. Oh. Eagle. The Eagle has landed. Eagle landed. It's called Eagle. So, in other words, we're talking in our time, which is very interesting. But uh, so there would be a time when Taka that we'd make our home amongst the stars. This is the International Space Station going round and round and round. Um, I feel it's like the Kanesha, even if he flies like an angel. Uh, there will come. There will come an end to this, but it's not a natural thing that ends. Whereas if it is something of time, then it's got a natural end. Avram Avinu, to go back to where we, before we went off at the tangent, Avram Avinu, if he follows the same model, then if he is put into Golis, which he does as soon as he arrives in Eretz Yisrael, there must be something innately wrong with Avram Avinu, and the thing that's wrong with Avram Avinu is Chesed. <coughs> because Chesed is a dangerous thing, which is why Chesed has halochas. There are halochas for Chesed. Because the problem with Chesed is that if you are a, uh, an Iba Gigeben type person, if you're a philanthropic person, I've never thought that before. It's philanthropic, it's very nice. Um, then, if you're that sort of person, you'd find it very difficult to say no. Rav Shalom of Olban, Ali Shor Chelik Aleph, which I didn't bring down. You remember, we showed, I showed you before the Midas clock, his famous Midas clock. And he says there that the Mida that leads to Znus is Chesed. So you've got all sorts of different personality traits. But if you're a Baal or Baal is Chesed, then again, you are in danger because. You don't know how to say no. You don't know how to say no. And as a consequence, um, you could get yourself into circumstances which are, you know, I remember uh, when I decided no longer to do counselling uh, uh, for women. Um, there was a, uh, my wife and I were counselling somebody who was in a very horrible situation and she sent an email which was clearly flirtatious, which I got very offended by because I hadn't spent my whole life to get to, you know, past 60 and suddenly, you know, um, and of course, not only is, was it so inappropriate, but um, in today's world, an accusation, even a totally groundless accusation, thank you, a totally groundless accusation. I wonder if people here are wondering what that, who are listening to watch this this year, you know, a 10 minute shift of the shear every week, I hear a sheep going back. What, what is that? What is it? We've got a clock. Instead of a cuckoo clock, out comes a sheep. It's a yuku clock. And it goes bad, just in case you're wondering what that is. Um, so, but of course, in, the, in today's world, you know, it, it's an accusation and you're dead. And there are very, very strange people out there. Think of what happened to Judge Kavanaugh um, when uh, this ridiculous accusation. But no, that was it. It's, she was a woman, therefore she had to be believed. Um, and therefore somebody said to me, but people, and I said, I'm, and I can't, I'm not seeing women, you know, marital problems, something like that. Husband and wife, of course, that's different. But no, I'm not doing that anymore. And it was a lady I'd been helping. She said, but ladies need you. And I said, yeah, but maybe that's true. However, uh, charity starts at home, as we'll talk about in a second. And anyway, you know, there is enough women out there 
who could give etzes to women. In fact, I think a woman will be able to understand and give etzes more to a woman. But if you're a Baal Chesed, but not women say, but, you know, people need your advice, then you can hear it tearing at your heartstrings and say, oh, yeah, <laughs> because I'm so wonderful. I'm so modest. Yeah, I must do that. And then you can get sucked into all sorts of inappropriate uh, stuff. And sadly, one hears about that. So stuff going on. Anyway, so that's the media that would, be, would get you into trouble. However, even, talking about that, because the Torah has to be written, and the Torah is for everybody. That means the Torah is written for the most sophisticated mind, the Vilna Gaon, um, or the most simple mind, a children, a children's mind. And, and children's minds, therefore, have to be able, the Torah has to talk in a language which, uh, which is Shabbat Kol Nefesh. And so indeed, there was a fellow called Avram, and he was a wonderfully kind person, and he did all sorts of wonderful stuff. And that's but at an extraordinarily simplistic level, really. Of course, it's true, it's about chesed. But the chesed of Avram of Vino is poof, uh, and a sheer of sophistication, a level of sophistication, which is, which is breathtaking. And when you think about chesed for just a little bit further, and there's so much to say about chesed, really, but again, let me remind you that because chesed is a thing, it's a zach, it's a midah, that it has got Gedorim. It has got Gedorim. Remember I told the Ted story about the, the famous uh, um, uh, rabbi, uh, not rabbi, uh, a person from a very, very famous rabbinic family. If I mention him, he got one. And he wrote to me from Chicago once because I'd, I'd written a story um, that happened to me in Hamadiyam. I call him in Hamadiyam. So the story was like this, that um, I'd been, um, I was invited to do a Shabbaton in one of the uh, southern states in a small town in one of the southern states. And when I arrived there, uh, I met a couple there whose accent was so incongruous and stood out like a sore thumb. Everybody saying, you all. Ah, Shabbat Shalom, you all. Um, which was very, very sweet. Uh, and there was a couple there uh, who came from Brooklyn, you know, and uh, you know, everything's nasal and through the nose. And so they, they stood out like a sore thumb or a sore nose. Um, and they were, I, I would say, my own age, Oh, I used to say older couple. Wrong! Middle-aged, young middle-aged, <laughs> vibrant, healthy. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, so oh, I said, well, you know, where you, was that a New York accent? Yeah, where they came from? I think it's Slapfish or Bar Park, something like that. What are you doing here? I mean, this is a sort of place that struggles to get me in and Shabbos, let alone during the week. So the, the fellow uh, and his wife had been in business with somebody else, and somebody else had stolen all the money. And they beat the rabbi, the local rabbi, and he tried to help, but it hadn't succeeded. And they, they felt betrayed by the rabbi, they felt betrayed by the king, and they felt betrayed by New York, Brooklyn, New York. And so they ended up in, I won't say where, because I'm far too diplomatic. Anyway, so uh, I wrote about this, and I said that they, they did say the rabbi had tried to help, um, but it's very easy to complain that somebody didn't do enough for you, but, you know, I was, in def I was defending the rabbi. So this person with a very, very famous uh, rabbinic family name wrote and said, this is a, you know, a private letter, this is a cop-out. And you know, you guys always say this. Yeah, he, he tried to help, but he didn't try hard enough. But he can always, he can always, he should have and could have always gone for, uh, further. And I said, I agree with you that he could have gone, so I wrote, replied, I, could, I, I agree with you, he could have done more. Well, he says he should do more. Because Chesed has Gedorim. Chesed has Gedorim. So we know when it comes to um, giving tzedakah, there's ten percent, and if you're really got a huge amount of income, there could be twenty percent. But why not more? And the halakha says that's it. Boom, you finished at that point. Why not more? So the Gemara famously says your children are going to say, "Oh, thanks very much for making us poor by helping them out of poverty." So what sort of chesed is that? Gates. Sorry. You're Bill, you're Bill Gates. I'm Bill Gates? If you're Bill Gates. Oh, thought you'd give me a brocha. I was getting excited. Yeah, go on. You can give away $40 billion. Instead of oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the interesting thing is, and I don't want to go off, but, uh, and I think I've told you this before anyway, that Bill Gates, is le he's written, he's, he's leaving for each of his children $5 million. Mm -hmm. The $5 million is hardly a huge amount of money for somebody to leave $5 billion. In fact, he's leaving them, I can't remember if it's 25 or $50 billion each, there's four kids. He's leaving them a huge amount of billions which they have to give away in the course of their lifetime. So somebody says, why are you not giving them any, you know, more money themselves? Because, I mean, today, I mean, go back to Brooklyn, today five million dollars is a house to buy and a house to live, one to live in and one to live off. That would be, right, he could, give them, he, he could buy Brooklyn. He probably could come to think of it, huh? 
huge amount of money. He said it wouldn't be good for them and it wouldn't be good for, for, for other people as well. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the biggest clothing you want to give somebody yeah, uh, is you, sh you, should have in, you should have inherited wealth. Inherited wealth. If you're a Bill Gates and you start from nothing and build yourself up, that's one thing. When I, when I send copies of my books, um, then I, uh, they're available, uh, then I very often put inside, um, you should have a life of achievement. And it's the best broker I can think of. Because you've got a life of achievement, you feel fulfilled, you feel you've done what you could have done and, and became what you could have become, etc. But if you feel you didn't maximise yourself, then you feel really dreadful, which reminds me of the scene tomorrow night and how much of the tomorrow I still got to finish. Um, okay. <laughs> <coughs> so, oh, I shouldn't have said that one. Okay, back to this. Actually, where did I leave off? Can go to yours. 20%. 20%. Oh, so they're a good drawing for this, 20%. How much is it when it comes to lending money? Someone comes and says to you, what's the shear? So interesting, the Chavaz Chaim in his Sefer Ahavaz Chesed, and when you think of the title of Ahavaz Chesed, you think it's a book about, you know, the philosophy, the Hashkofa of, of philanthropy. No, it's not. It's a halacha book. And he says there is no shear for, for lending money. It's what you're comfortable with, what you can at the time. You know your financial situation. They're a good drawing for tzedakah. And if you go beyond the Gedorim, then it's no longer it's no longer a mitzvah. In breaches, it says in in, in Yudches and Yudtes, ki yedativ, lamanasha yitzab is bonov. Rashi says yedativ is an expression of love, affection. I loved him. So this is Hashem speaking. Lamanasha yitzab is bonov, but it's beisa achron, because he commanded his children and his household to to go in his ways. Uh, to do tzedek and tzedek and to do chesed, etc. But he started with his own family. Your own family comes first. So, uh, of course, this fellow, this, this fellow who was attacking rabbis is right. Of course, they could do more. We could all do more. But who said you should do more? Chesed has a sheer. Did I tell you the story about Winston Churchill? There was a very, uh, I was mentioning this to a friend of mine who's a dying in, in Manchester. Down West Times, I was angry stark. And he told me an incredibly interesting story. Uh, Winston Churchill, during the second, or the lead up just before the Second World War in the 1930s, I think 1933, if I remember rightly, England enjoyed a period, a strange period, they had three kings in one year. The present queen, who's 93, bless her, um, her grandfather died, and her, old, and her uncle, and it was called Edward, but they, the family's name was David, he became, he became king. However, he insisted that if he was going to stay on the throne, then he would have to, uh, the, the country would have to accept his wife. Now, he'd done an incredibly, incredibly terrible thing. He'd married an American. American. Oh, yeah, that's enough, please. Don't, don't say it. It's, he married an American. Shock horror. But not only did he marry an American, he married somebody called Wallace Simpson, whom he'd been having an adulterous affair with for a long, long time. Um, I mean, she was married to somebody else. Uh, she'd been married three times. She was also a Nazi, incidentally. And seriously, she was a she was a Nazi agent, um, and uh, it was very very fortunate because her husband was a Nazi as well. Uh, anyway, so he insisted that he would he that he had to the country would have to accept this woman. Well, first of all, she's American, and that's of course the worst of all. Um, second of all, she was a divorcee, and the laws of the royal family at the time stated that the king has to marry somebody who's. You know, never been married before. In fact, she has to be a basula. I just checked to make sure uh, Princess Diana had to go through a, a whole medical procedure of, of checking out she was a basula before she could marry Prince Charles. Bearing in mind his activities, that might seem slightly ironic. Um, like nephew, like uncle, or whatever the phrase would be. Um, anyway, be, oh gosh, this doesn't take that in real trouble. Uh, anyway, so, we can edit that up, last bit out. Because the Queen might watch this. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> Um, anyway, so the, it's funny that the, the, the entire country was against us. The people were against it. The church was against it. The politicians were against it. Uh, the, the press was against it. Um, and the rest of the royal family were against it. There was only one voice that was speaking out in favour of this marriage, and that was the most erudite voice of the generation, which was Vincent Churchill, perhaps because his own mother was American. And as a consequence of that, Nobody took anything else he said seriously because he thought he was crazy, he's just stupid and nuts. Which was a pity because the other thing he was campaigning on at the time was the fact that Britain should reinvade Germany, reinvade the Rhineland, and disarm, it, disarm the German army, who in, in contravention, contravention, contravention 
uh, of the, uh, um, the Treaty of Versailles was rearming, which we weren't allowed to do. And who knows, as it were, and of course Hashem uh, was pulling the strings, but who knows uh, what would have happened if he hadn't campaigned on behalf of Wallace Simpson marrying Edward. In other words, this dime, the point that Diane was making was, you've got to choose your battles. You can't do it all. When you go and see a rabbi with a problem, you know, I know, that my problem is the most important problem in the world, and why aren't you helping with this? But you don't know what other battles he's facing. Chiefly, this one here. Hashem says, I loved Avram because he, he, he commanded his children and his family before. Rabbi Dessa says at the beginning, right at the beginning, how many Rabonim's children off the derrick because the father was too busy helping other people and other people's children and neglected their own children. To go back to this, we're talking about Avram Avinu, so therefore, the, this is chesed at a, a, a very, very simple level. And, but Avram Avinu works at an extremely more sophisticated level than that. And Rabbi Dessa, the Kelly base of Mithra Medio, um, he's got a a very, very deep uh, essay here, which I, I looked at beforehand. I didn't do some preparation. It's in page 183, and it's about Tefillah's Avram of Sidaim. Avram davening for Sidaim. So he says that really there was, there's three types of Tefillah. Uh, one is Atta Asur Rachamim, it's called Tefillah. And then it's Pius, when you appease Hashem. And then there's another type of Tefillah, and that is when you go to war with Hashem. And when Avram says to Hashem, Baruch, will you... Uh, wipe out the good guys for the bad guys. It's an accusation. It's fighting with Hashem. That's a Mulchama. It's very, very reminiscent of, of Moshe Rabbeinu when he says, Lama Hari Oysa La'amazeh, which we've discussed many times before, the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin Kufala. There's the Rashi there that quotes a Medrash, which incidentally we've lost, but the Medrash it says, when the babies were stuffed in the walls, Moshe Rabbeinu said, Lama Hari Oysa La'amazeh. From the moment I went to speak in your name, things got much worse for Cloud of Strash. I know what I'm doing. No, as when we discussed this again not too long ago, the obvious question was, I honestly think that all the people sitting around this table, and certainly even me, that if you see something which is really, really painful, and remember I talked to you, we mentioned that uh, Rabbi Yomin Moskovitz lost another child, did I tell them? Did we talk about that? Yeah. I mean, gosh, somebody's lost six children. Go, oh. But if a voice came out then and said, you I know what I'm doing, then well, all right. It would be a comfort. I mean, Hashem's not going He says the same to Moshe Rabbeinu. No, the spiritual level of why my Rubenstein is sort of like you need. You couldn't see it. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu had a rakia. Um, so if I get it, why didn't he get it? And so the, the bar, I can't remember where I saw this, but it's not that Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't get it. Of course he gets it. He says, but how can I sell it to them? How can I sell it to them? You mean you didn't believe it? What? If you don't believe No, I don't know how to sell it. Sell it. I can get it. But how can you tell? How can you give an answer that somebody's not able to hear, right? So you know, if you go to the Sheba house, your first duty is to say nothing, because it might be the wrong thing to say. So somebody saying nothing is the right thing to say. So if you can't say the right thing, Shabbat Tai, so you don't say anything at all. But what if a whole dar is not able to say it? So, Rukhan um, Friedlander, in his uh, wonderful uh, sefer, he says, he says. Um, um, that when we uh, we say when we say Hashem's name or we come to Hashem's name in, in davening, uh, so you can see it in these parish in Olenu, we say Hashem's name in, in the UK Vovke name. We say well, we don't say it. We say Adonai, which simply means my master, right? Okay. So why don't we say it? So again, something we talked about not too long ago. That if you take the letters and rearrange them, it gets to be Iye Hoya and Hoive. Is was and will be, and and midas harachamim is designated or hinted at when it's yud kevavke. So if it's the midas harachamim, and it's all, that means it always was rachamim, always will be rachamim, always is rachamim, is rachamim now. So is is that you clear here with me? Okay, and, then, do you, and you understand that. So you understand that Oshus is being being God's rachamim. Yeah. No, exactly. So because we can't get it. Always says Adinoi, which means my master, and the Kabbalah, the way that seven has to accept what the master does, says, because he's the master. <laughs> You've got no choice in the matter. We have no choice, we do not see it. Remember, when Nochem Ish Gamzu, whatever happened in his life, said, he said Gamzu Lataiva, as I pointed out to you once, he said he still had to say Borg Dain Emes. That means here, Gamzu Lataiva, I can figure it out here, but he's still a human being, he still hurts, and therefore here, there's a bracha for him to make, Borg Dain Emes. Because this hurts. So, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu uh, is really asking, how am I going to explain it to them? 
Rabbi Dessa says, of course, let's say with Avram Avinu, when he's fighting, as it were, with Hashem, and saying, you know, how could you do such a thing? He means there is a bit of me at my madriga, is what he says here, maybe I'll read this a little bit to you. He's saying, when he's, when he's asking for this not to happen, he's fighting for this not to happen, he's saying, there's a bit of me at my Madriga. And remember, Abba Madriga is not as high as my Shreve There will be a bit of me that doubt will feel it being... Now, this is microscopic. His wife has got much greater sympathy for Sadai, and that's why she turns around to look at it. Um, that's what he said. This'll be a chil Hashem. And therefore, it will be a chil in the eyes of other people because there's a bit of me that doesn't get this. Never, I can't convey this to them. But of course, this is way way down the, the, the line of 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 Avram Vina's tests. And eventually, of course, Avram Avinu is mashing himself. The tests that come are tests of gavur, tests of where, where uh, it's midas hadin. Everything that, that, uh, that Hashem gives Avram Avinu are tests of his years Hashem, to leave his own father or his old father alone, which some people count as one of his tests, various opinions on that one. But to leave his own father or old father alone. And you're Mr. Chesed. And you're going to leave him alone for 60 years. He's still going to live for another 60 years. He's not, you know, he's not a geysis. He's not, you know, one foot in the grave and the other foot in a banana peel. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's tacky tough. Or when the Shem says to him, uh, Mitzvah bris mila. The al Shmoni reports that he says, he says, I'd rather not have it. I'd rather not have it. Why? Because my whole tachlis is bringing people tachlis can't be ashkina bringing people closer to Shem, and it's easy, a, a table which is more luxurious, uh, more, more sumptuous than Shlomo Melech's at the height of his powers. And, uh, you know, we talk, we schmooze, Friday night, meal, Ronfin, Singapore whiskey, absolutely everything. Very advanced in those days, people don't know this. Um, and so of course, so of, now I've got to sit in, oh, because they're, they're about to sign on the dotted line. Yes, fine. Gareth Zedek, that's me. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, there's one last thing I forgot to mention. Right. Ping! And you can see them like flying the, the tent flap as they rush out. Absolutely not. <coughs> Hashem says to him, It's enough that I am I'm your God. There has to be a balance of years Hashem and a half as Hashem. And at the end of his life, when he gets to um, what most people agree is the tenth test, when he's about to shecht his son's throat, which definitely doesn't make any sense to him, but now the master thing is kicked in, then of course Hashem calls out and says, Avram, 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 Tishloch, Yalzka, Alan, Arwa, Taslam, Avgi, Ata, Yedati. Ki Yira, Lekimata. Avram, Avram, don't stretch your hand, hand, hand out to the lad. Don't do anything to him, because now I know you're a Yira, Elohim. Oh, now he's reached that level. There's a synthesis of both. Fine. So, if that's true, and he reaches such a high level, although you remember and I don't know if you actually did that. Did we do the Rubini Yoyna and Avram Maris and Machpelah? Did I do that with you? Oh, okay. oh that's so good. And, oh, next week, because I'm going for uh, my grandson's briefs, then we'll be here next Wednesday. So, after that. Okay. Anyway, so here is the, this is the wonderful sefer called Orat Sofen, from Nosa Finkel, the author of Hissel Vodka. And he writes, um, I've been tw- twice, I was with the Jewish Heritage Centre, as you know, for, uh, for Shavuos, and it's run by Chofetz Chaim guys. Um, and I quoted this, and, they went, no. and before that, as you know, it was in as Las Vegas, and all the gear there is by, again, by Chofetz Chaim guys, who are all, you know, Hasidim with this book. Which is out of print, they didn't know that. Anyway, and they didn't know it. But they also like, you read that, you learn that, you learn that. Mm-hmm. You don't say Because of the Torah, but Achri Kain, Kovar Avram Es Sarah Ishtai. So Rabbini Yonah says, uh, but the, the ultimate test was the was the, the bearing of sorry you made it. Have we not done this? Oh, good. I'm sorry, you'll, 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 I promise you, two weeks time you're going to you're going to enjoy. Uh, why is that the ultimate test? I'm going to show you what the Alshak said, but for the night, uh, let's let's stale with what he says. Um, how to conceive? That's what the Medrash says. Roid of tzedakah, the chesed, yimsar chayim tzedakah v'kovat. It's possible to Mishli. In, uh, in its Kof Aleph Kof base. So again, 
It says, Roid of Tzedakah, if you're chasing after Tzedakah, the Chesed, Yim Sechaim Tzedakah, and Kovat, you'll get, you'll get, bring you life, and Tzedakah, you'll get Tzedakah, and Kovat, and you'll give Kovat. Fine. What does that mean? So the Medrash says, Tzedakah ze Avram. Tzedakah, the person referred to in the Posseg when he talks about Tzedakah, that's Avram Avidu. There's a Posseg which re- refers to that. Mishon Raderach Hashem, last of Tzedakah. And Avram guarded the way of Hashem, that Posseg there, to do Tzedakah, the one we just read. <coughs> the Chesed, and Chesed, mm, that's also him, Shagomel Chesed Lesora, that he did give us to Tzedakah, and he buried her. Now, I'm going to pause. Are you happy with that? Does that strike you as strange? And he buried his wife. Right, so that, that this is the posseg that defines Avram Avinu. Okay, let's go, back to, let's go back to elementary school. Boys, give me an example of Avram Avinu's chesed. What would you say? Hachnosis are well done. Anybody want to elaborate? <laughs> and elaborate in what our dear Chava says there? What does it mean? He, he did Hachnosis orchim? And his tenant for openings. And his tenant for openings, right? Uh, Anything uh, else? Malachim. And the Malachim. He was so troubled by the fact Hashem had sent an unbelievably hot day, a Hamsin. Or, or an ultra ham seed to keep people away from him on the third day when he was recovering from Bris Mila. But he saw, as Rashi says, he was more distressed by the inability to do chesed than the pain, the physical pain that he was having either by <laughs> sizzling in the sun or by the Bris Mila. So he sends along some Malachim. He doesn't know the Malachim, he thinks it's just ordinary Arab folk. Um, but anyway, shine. Right? And a million other things as well. Okay? Chesed, 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 chesed. That's well done. Well done, class. That's very good. How about the fact that he buried his wife? What? What would you say to somebody who didn't bury their wife? Just, you know, leave her in the garden, you know, and just, just doesn't agree. Well, what was, what was that's, that's the, the definition of Avram as being Mr. Chesed. Tzedakah is impossible, but Tzedakah very, so he used to give money to people. That's very nice. But the definition is the fact that he buried Tzedakah, as they say. So I'll come back to that in just a second. Oh, the hoops are interesting, but I don't think I don't. No, that's um, these. That's the test. The says that's the test. I want to show you why that's the test. We'll get to that in two weeks' time. And the answer to that is super duper brilliant. Uh, however, he's saying here that the definition of his chesed, the culmination, the zenith, the spitz of his chesed, was the fact that he buried Sora. That doesn't seem a very high madriga. Right? It's hard to imagine somebody who wouldn't bury their wife, whom they loved and been married to for the entirety of their life. Do you remember, did, did we do the essay of Rav Shlomo Volvo called Frumkite? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Let's just remind ourselves of that then. So here, uh, yes, I remember doing this because I needed your, your translation because the Hebrew was very difficult here. Um, he says, Frumkite, he de chuf tivoy, we said it's a, it's a basic instinct. Um, and, he, and he says it's not a Hebrew word at all, it's a Yiddish word. And then he says, instinctivi. Yes, that's why we needed a native Ivory speaker here. Instinctivi. Frumkai is an instinct, a basic instinct to attach yourself to Hashem is Borach. He says, however, like all human instincts, it is essentially uh, self preservation, which is the most fundamental human instinct. It's about me, it's about I. So let's just concentrate on this and, and put this together with Chesed for a second. Um, what is the Chesed Shal Emes? What's the definition of Chesed Shal Emes? Sorry? Mm-hmm. And Rashi gives a specific example. Sorry? Burying somebody. Or just the, the whole business of looking after a dead body. The Chevro Kaddish. Someone you don't know. Uh, no, not necessarily. But, yeah. Oh, 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 oh that, hold that thought. It's a very, very important thought you're making. But let, let's mm-hmm. let's just make it anybody for the moment. I'm going to qualify it in just a second. And it's the basic idea is if you if you stay up, you know, you're in part of the Chevra Kadisha. Have you ever anybody here done Shemira? No. One. Okay. One or two. Okay. So just in case for the people who've known, uh, as I'm sure our uh, our Chavirim uh, here will tell us, um, because they don't warn you this, you know that dead bodies make noises. 
<laughs> you, you're going to love this. This is, a, this is a good trick, a magic trick here. <laughs> first time I was doing this, I was a young man. And because gases escape from the body, but you don't know that. You're just sitting beside a body under a sheet, a sheet and something goes, uh. <laughs> and he's 2 a.m. and you're by yourself. That's right, you're 2 a.m. and you're by yourself. And suddenly went, uh. um, in the morning when they come back to relieve you, you might find two corpses lying there. <laughs> oh, absolutely awful. Uh, right, but one thing is absolutely certain, um, is, at least I hope it's certain, um, that in the middle of the night, the corpse isn't going to sit and say, Thank you so much. I really appreciate what you're doing for me. I know you probably got other things to do. And it's such a big mess. Let me just take out my check with the right your check. Okay. Uh, that's not going to happen, right? That bit's not going to happen. But remember, but, uh, that one. Okay. Um, anyway, so basically, uh, because the problem is, so that's why it's for limit. Because, well, as we just heard, family, you know. What? The family would each other appreciation. Yeah, the family. Oh, f first of all, right? So the general. And, and people, you know that what comes here comes around. If you're the, if you're the guy, <laughs> yeah. they're going to give you a Yeah, I was just, just going to say, I was going to invite you to be cynical, but you were right off at the beginning. Boom! You know, you wait for the, the starting pistol. It's it's straight out of the door. Okay, okay, can you give me another example? It can be even more cynical, what else? <laughs> so let's say the family's poor, so there's no money coming from the family. And let's say you, you refuse. No one much. knows about it. Oh, people ask the problem. People do know about it. You're in the clever condition. Right. So suppose somebody comes up and says to you, you know, slaps you on the you stay up with dead bodies. Oh, and they make noises, don't they? Well, I could never do that. You're incredible. Then there could be a stick guy, right? Um, and not only that, as you say, maybe the family are rich. You never know where in the back of you. If you needed yeah, help from me. Just appreciation. Sorry, what, what, what? Just the appreciation. What the appreciation? If they express their appreciation, even if you're not. You're not allowed to take it. I mean, if, you, if you're a member of the Cabo Condition, you're not allowed to take money. The Cabo well, they're paid, aren't you? Oh, I should hope not. On oh, England, so I thought it was. Okay. Oh, okay, so we know. Oh, okay, fine. Um, there's that. So that, but the point is that if you're going to get anything out of anything, if, if you wanted me to help you in whatever it is, and I happen to know that your father or you are a multi millionaire, and of course you're not allowed to join this year unless you are, um, then it might be that, you know, of course I'll help you because I'm a really extremely nice person, but it might be something at the back of I'm modest, but it might be something at the back of my mind. That says, you know, gosh, if I help him, you know, I would get in trouble one day. You know, he might help me. And even if it's only 1% of your motivation, or 0.01%, then it's not Chesed Shalemus, is it? Mm -hmm. It's not Chesed Shalemus. So, how do you overcome this? So, this is what he says here. This could be, we'll come down in a second. So, he says a very interesting thing. He says, therefore, um, as from, from Kite is egotistis, anochias, anochias. Um, uh, is it all I driven? Then he says, if that's the case, then Pu'ula bin Adam Lachavera gam Maisel Shema bin Adam Lamakam in his enemy Frunkai. Then if your motivations are based on Frunkai of I, then if it's I in it, then by definition it's not 100%. It's something that you're getting from it. Okay, and then let's cut to the chase because we did, as I said, we did this not too long ago. He calls the slab, uh, the Sabah Mislobotka, which of course is the safer word again here. Um, and, so, and he says, and as I told you the last time we looked at this, that you always tell them, you can tell them that Vartar is really superb if both the Hasidim and, and the Litvites claim it as theirs. <laughs> this is so good, I've heard it said in the Shem Devon Nagon and the Val Shem Tov, so you can take whatever you like. Ramnosti, you think of Sam, he says, uh, there's a mitzvah of the which is the defining mitzvah of Chesed, is it not? And still, he says, listen, you've got to love your neighbor, your your fellow, as you love yourself, is atzvah ena oyev l'shem mitzvah el hab shuta. Don't love yourself because it's a mitzvah, do you? You're supposed to love somebody not because it's a mitzvah. That's also part of the problem. Another huge problem. If we leave all the cynicism that you come up with, cynic, um, at the bottom of the table, even if none of those apply, but you know you're getting a reward for doing a mitzvah of a dead body. And looking after a dead body, or burying a dead body, etc. So therefore, the, it, it can't possibly be a, a chesed shal emes. Because automatically, you're getting something back. You're getting all of a ball. That's pretty big. So if that's the case, where is the chesed shal emes? And here it says you've got to love somebody. After look at a brilliant observation. You don't love yourself because it's a mitzvah. Do you? Because I'm great. Well, you... 
you've been to your shows, <laughs> your magic shows. I've, I've only seen one. I uh, have no chance to praise you fully. Okay, you get the idea? So therefore, this is something to think about. But here is, uh, I find that another extent, an extension is, because uh, here in the Altus of Lobotka, uh, when you ask this question that we just touched a second ago with regards to, uh, with regards to Sor and Avram, that's the ultimate chesed. And he's got a whole bunch of little paragraphs here going on to say that the problem is whenever there's I in, in anything you do, then it can't possibly be the Shem Shemayim, if we're talking 100%, pure Shem Shemayim. When you do Shemira for the day yeah. is that a chesed for him or for his family? Who's it, who's it a chesed Not for? the dead person. And he cares? He's, he's hovering over and watching the whole thing. Absolutely. You, the, the soul remains attached to the body. So there's a long sort of like letting go process, mm -hmm. various bits of the soul. Let's not get to that on Kabbalistic. Or you will not sleep tonight. Um, so he says here, "Vini ikur kim ritzana shal mokum hu, shetei mitzvah chesed nasis kach, shu kula chesed." So he says, "But the real, what, really, what Hashem wants from you is to copy Him and the behavior of Hashem, because the ultimate chesed, of course, is Hashem is borach, is it not? That's the ultimate chesed. Oh, no chesed, you money. Why? I think I told you once. One of my university students came bouncing into Hill House once, so excited. He was studying." He was studying theology, which is a disastrous degree to study. If you want to, if you want to be an, make happy course, send them to university to study religion. That'll make a happy course. So he's explaining to me that the um, that the um, the, the pref professor had proven to him that God cannot exist. Well, of course, you want to go and study theology to prove that there is no such such subject, really. Uh, and, and what was the was the, the proof? It was the classic argument, can God create a stone that's too happy, heavy for him to, to, mm -hmm. to lift up? So if you say that he can, then that's not God. If you say that he can, right, then he can create something that's too heavy for him to lift up, and therefore he's limited once more and he's not God. And I said, oh yeah, but, you know, and he, <laughs> this is an undergraduate, this is a wow, <laughs> epiphany, oh, giloy, this is unbelievable, it's like crazy, I'm like, ah, you know, he's so excited. So and I was in my own naivety. I said, "Aha!" Uh -huh. And and how did he? How did he tell you to gain say that argument? How did no. he, to gain say to uh, beat the argument? How do you destroy that argument? He didn't. That was it. That was the class. And there is no, you know, second class. And next week, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'll teach you how to refute that argument. No, no, that was it. This guy's being paid a salary to teach this ignorance. Right? He didn't, he didn't know the counter-argument. And of course the counter-argument is there is nothing greater than God. So he can't make a rock that is too big for him to carry because there's nothing greater than God. But that's not a proof of his limitedness, but his limitlessness. Because there's nothing greater than God. And I explained this to him and he went, ooh, ooh, okay. But the ultimate chesed is because Hashem doesn't need to make this world, he lacks nothing. He lacks nothing. And therefore, because he lacks nothing, automatically that means that he chose to make the world purely as a giving thing. There's nothing you give back to Hashem. If we all stood outside and eat pork sandwiches, the whole of Klamathron, tomorrow coordinated throughout the world at one o'clock, it doesn't hurt Hashem in the slightest. Do you hurt yourself? He gets kicks, though. No, he does not get kicks. No. That's not all Losh and Vinay Adam. All Losh and Adam. Hashem is perfect, he doesn't get cakes, he doesn't need cakes, he's got no emotions, these are nuts, that's not how it works. So he says, therefore, but what we are supposed to do is to try and emulate Hashem, and it should be kulo chesed. That means to say from your point of view and from the point of view of the person getting the chesed, there should be no, the person shouldn't be made to feel a nosh leper, shouldn't be, feel a nebuch, feel, you know, a, a pitiful, sad being. That's why, of course, Chesed has to be organized in such a way that the self-respect, as much as possible, of the recipient is maintained. What's the number one way of doing Chesed for somebody? Set him up in business. Number two, you don't know who you're giving to, and he doesn't know who he's getting from. You've got to maintain the person's self-respect. Because, sorry, so 
then that's why you have to start at home, as the Apostle says, from your own flesh and blood, you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, blind yourself to their suffering. And again, Hashem said that in the Apostle and Vratius, that the easiest way to give chesed automatically, without thinking what you're getting by, is if it's somebody who's you, your wife, or your children. Do you think I'm getting oil of a ball because your kid, you know, you, you send your kid to a school? Do you think you're getting oil of a ball because your wife's sick and you stay to look after her? Or will you bury her? No, because it's a half lyric of Kamaycha. The chesed you do for yourself is because you feel you love yourself. The chesed you do for somebody who you see as yourself, that's the ultimate chesed. For all the chesed of Aram and the highest Madriga, still, the chesed he did for Sora is the purest form because ultimately, it literally is like you see as though she is you. We talked not too long ago about how you do that. It's, it's the muscle memory. You build a muscle memory and you build a chesed memory. Rambam says you've got $100 to give to a poor person. You can give $100 to one person make a significant difference in their life. Or you can give $1 bill to 100 people. Which one should it be? The latter. Because you're training yourself all the time and all the time. You can make it a muscle memory, a chesed memory that's automatic, built within you. It's automatic and built within you when it's your wife, when it's your parents, etc., etc., and certainly when it's your children, that you do it without thinking. The more you practice chesed, the more even though it could be that if somebody was to analyze it, didn't you know that the guy was rich? Yeah, but that's not why I did it. I was, I was a neat automat, that's why I am. I'm Mr. Chesed. Then it's, you don't do chesed for somebody else. Sorry, you don't love somebody else. Because the mitzvah, you love just because that's the right thing. It's natural. You've taken out the egotistic, you do it automatically. There is a way to actually purge yourself of your eye but that is training yourself to do it automatically. <coughs> and when famously Rabbi Kiva was being slaughtered, uh, literally in the flesh torn from him by the Romans, and he was saying Shema, and the Tomeim said, even now, he said, I've been working my whole life for this. This is a whole lifetime project to get to so many things we've been discussing. And at that point, the chesed is natural. At the highest point, even what Avram Avinu, for everything we've said, the sophisticated level, the Medrash says, but the ultimate, his ultimate chesed, and he buried his wife. To get to that madriga, you have to build yourself again and again and again, giving, so that it's just natural. You don't even think, you don't want to think. It's like breathing. Chesed becomes a breathing, which is the automatic de definition of what a Jew is.